Shalom and welcome to Treasured Inheritance Ministry with myself, Yosef Ben Avram. And I'm extremely excited to present to you today this teaching entitled, Are We Once Saved, Always Saved? The Importance of Maturity. I know that in my walk with Messiah Yeshua that this question has come up often in theological circles, in discussions um, about the word, about what does it mean to be saved. People have always asked this question of, are we once saved, always saved? And if we are, then what does the scriptures say? And if we're not, then what does the scriptures say? So I believe that we have to have a look at this topic. We have to understand it in light of who we are meant to be in Messiah Yeshua. We are meant to be his bride. And we are supposed to, if we are the bride of Messiah Yeshua, then we are supposed to make ourselves ready. We are supposed to understand what Yeshua taught, what Yeshua desires from us, how he understood salvation, how he understood eternal life, how all the disciples understood it, and how we are supposed to understand it too. Without a correct understanding of this topic, we will not strive to be holy as Yahweh is holy. We will not be the people that he desires us to be, that bride that has made herself ready. So I really do believe that this subject and this teaching is one of extreme importance for us as believers and for us as the potential bride of Messiah Yeshua to understand and to also grasp and move forward. So without further ado, let's pray and then let's get straight into this teaching. Father Yahweh, we want to thank you in the wonderful and powerful name of Yeshua Mashiach. Father, that you are our King and our Father. Father, that you sent Yeshua as your only begotten Son so that we might be saved, so that we might be set free. And today, Father, we want to understand what that means. We want to understand what it truly means to be saved, to be set free, to be able to be reconciled with you, to be part of your family. And Father, I pray that people will come to understand now more than ever the importance of understanding what it really means means and how we can be the people that you have created us to be. I pray, Father, that every ear will have the ability through the power of your Spirit to hear, that every person, Father, will, will, will come and that they will receive, Father, and that when they leave after this teaching, that something inside of them would change, Father, that they will be changed and that they will pursue you in the beauty of holiness. We thank you for this time and we give you all the praise and all the glory. In Messiah Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, like I said, how important do you think it is to Yahweh that we understand what salvation means? I believe that it is so imperative that we as the people of Yahweh come to understand this importance of what salvation actually is. Another question I like to ask you is, do you know for sure that you are really saved? And do you believe that all you need in this life is to confess your sins and then that's it, that you go away and you live your life, you go to your church, you, you go to your congregation, you go to your Torah group, you do whatever you feel is correct, and that's what it means to be saved. Do you, do you believe that, you know, that all you need in this life is to just confess your sins and then that's it? But what if Yeshua has more for you? What if our understanding of salvation is the main reason that we don't fully mature into the children of power and truth, the people of his dunamis power, the people of his presence, the people of that tangible presence of Yahweh, children that are truly set free, people that live in the inheritance of their father. That's what it really means. And that's the true desire that Yahweh has for you to understand what it means to be saved. You know, Abba Father wants you to understand that there is much more to being just a believer than just salvation. He wants you to understand that you are to mature, as we've spoken about excessively on this channel, to mature and to grow up, to be no longer a child that is tossed around by every wave of doctrine, but to become a real disciple, one that is rooted in Messiah Yeshua and able to bear much fruit. You know, many believers today, both within the church and the Messianic movement, they have an incorrect understanding of their salvation and due to this, they struggle to walk in covenant. And I've spoken how important it is to understand covenant, that they are progressive and that we have to move through the covenants of Yahweh in order to become a mature person. Now with this teaching, I hope to lay a foundation here that will build on all the teachings that have already been spoken about on this channel. 
You know, as many leave the church system, they still carry with them the doctrines of each denomination. And that's just a fact. Methodist, Anglican, AOG, whatever denomination you came out of. Sometimes we do this knowingly and others we do it unknowingly. But the truth is that there is merit in doctrine, but at the same time there is great danger when we place doctrine above the infallible word of Yahweh and we place it above Yahweh's truth, Yahweh's Torah, Yahweh's instructions, what he has given to us. We place the doctrines of men oftentimes above. And you know, Yeshua himself said that you have taken the word of Yahweh and you have twisted it for your doctrines, for your, your teachings, and you have made Yahweh's word null and void. So it's important that we understand what these doctrines are, but that we put them in their correct placing within our walk with the Father. That we do not take the doctrines of men and replace the word of Yahweh for these things. So the question that we'll need to answer in this teaching is firstly, where does the doctrine of once saved, always saved originate from? And does it stand up to the testing of the complete word of Yahweh? You know, when I was in seminary, they taught us that you cannot build a doctrine on one verse. You have to understand the context, the historical background. You have to understand everything in order to build a doctrine. You cannot take one verse here and one verse there and add it together and all of a sudden proclaim a doctrine. That's false. So in order to do this, we have to take a short look at the man who came up with this understanding of once saved, always saved. And many of you know who he is, John Calvin himself. Now what we need to understand is that Calvin was a tireless polemic. He was an apologetic writer who generated much controversy during his time. He wrote commentaries on most books of the Bible as well as theological treaties as well as confessional documents, and he regularly gave sermons throughout the week in Geneva. So he was a well-known person, somebody who had influence in the community that he was in. But Calvin was influenced by the Augustine tradition, which led him to expound the doctrine of predestination and this idea of absolute sovereignty of God in salvation. Calvin's writings and preaching provided the seeds for the branch of the theology that now bears its name, Calvinism. And the Presbyterian and other Reformed churches which looked to Calvin as a chief expositor of their beliefs, they have spread throughout the world and they hold tight to this understanding or this doctrine called once saved, always saved. Now one of the fundamental doctrines of Calvinism is this idea of unconditional election also known as predestination or foreordination. I want us to consider this quote from the Westminster Confession, and I'm going to read it to you in its entirety. It says, God from all eternity did by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will freely and unchangeably ordain whatsoever comes to pass. By the decree of God for the manifestation of his glory, some men and angels are predestined unto everlasting life, and others foreordained to everlasting death. These angels and men, thus predestined and foreordained, are particularly and unchangeably designed. And their number is so certain and definite that it cannot be either increased or diminished. Those of mankind that are predestined unto life, God before the foundation of the world was laid according to his eternal and immutable purposes, and the secret counsel and good pleasure of his will, hath chosen in Christ unto everlasting glory out of his free grace and love alone, without any foresight of faith or good works, or perseverance in either of them, or any other thing in the creature, as conditions or causes moving him thereunto. So basically what he's saying is, God has ordained these people by predestination and election, and it's got nothing to do with the foresight of their faith or their good works, or anything to do with perseverance in either of them, or any other thing in that creature as conditions. Any kind of other condition is not justifiable, if I have to put it that way. And he says, the rest of mankind, God was pleased to ordain them to dishonor and wrath for their sins. In other words, those who are not ordained will go to hell, and those that are will go to heaven. And there is nothing that anybody can do. It's not a a faith thing. It's not a works thing. It's not a perseverance thing. Now, take note of that word that he writes, perseverance. All right. And then he goes on and he says this, all those who God hath predestined unto life and those only he is pleased in his appointed and accepted time, effectively effectively to call by his word and spirit out of that state of sin and death in which they are by nature to grace and salvation by Jesus Christ. 
This effectual call is of God's free and special grace alone, not from anything at all foreseen in man, who is altogether passive therein. So he's saying that, you know, salvation and grace and everything is a passive thing on our behalf, that we get saved and then we don't have to do anything after that. It's all Yeshua himself. I believe that salvation is a free gift of Yahweh, but does he want you to remain just a saved person? Does he want you to be passive in your walk with him? Does he not want you to persevere? Does he not want you to press on? Does does faith not produce obedience? Doesn't James himself say that faith without works is dead? So how is it that Calvin writes all these things, but he misses all the other parts of scripture that apply to a believer's walk? It doesn't make sense. Now, what we need to understand is that biblical salvation, as the Bible tells us, is actually a continual walk with Yeshua, being loved by Him and thereby loving Him back, which allows us to then what? Love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Leviticus 19 verse 18 tells us that. You see, salvation is is not a magic trick. It's not a one-time mental ascent to believe that all of a sudden you go forward on a Sunday, somebody prays for you, you put your hands up, and all of a sudden you move from the state of, of, of being who you were to all of a sudden changing in an instant. No, it's a lifelong journey, and we know that. Continually believing, continually renouncing, continually walking with the Father. Our sins are forgiven the minute that we confess them. But then what about all the others that we collect as we walk this life out? It's a continuation, brothers and sisters, of asking the Father to help us, to change us, to make us stronger. You see, our faith has to be continually renewed in the living Elohim. Romans 12 verse 1 to 2 tells us this. It says, I call upon you therefore, brothers, through the compassion of Elohim, to present your bodies as a living offering, set apart, well-pleasing to Elohim, your reasonable worship. And then it says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Who's he talking to? Believers. He's not talking to an unbeliever here. Paul's talking to believers and he's telling them that we need to continually renew our minds so that we may prove what is the good and well-pleasing and perfect desire of Elohim. In other words, we need to continually ask the Father to renew our minds so that we might mature and not fall by the wayside. You know, just as the, the children of Israel, just as they ate the daily manna that came to them in the wilderness, so too must we, each and every one of us, we must eat the living manna every day, or else our belief in Yeshua will die of, 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 of salvation of starvation we will we will we will literally that's why Yeshua says I am the bread of life bread it was something that was consumed on a daily basis we have to continually remain in him Yeshua himself says it if you remain in me and my words what words the words of life found in his Torah if the words of Yeshua remain in you and you remain in him that's a different whole different perspective than what Calvin was teaching Let's go on. The new covenant, you know, it unquestionably refers to election and predestination, but Calvinists often quote these passages almost as, as, as though the mere mention of the words proves their brand of predestination. It's almost as if because the words are in the Bible, then it has to prove everything that they say. But it's oftentimes taken out of context. You know, we have to say this though. I believe that we all agree that Yahweh has chosen, He has elected certain people, and that the elect have been foreordained to eternal life. But the question is, how is it determined whether or not any particular individual is or is not among the elect? And is that determined unconditionally or conditionally? You know, the Bible doctrine of predestination is that Yahweh chose a body or group of people to be saved, but that each individual has the power to choose whether or not to be in that body. We have the, the ability to choose whether we want to be part of the family of Yahweh. It is your decision. You have free will. To illustrate, consider a country with voluntary military service. Imagine the president chooses the special forces for a specific mission. The general calls the special forces, what, an elect body because the president chose them, rather than, let's say, the navy or the army. But the president did not choose each individual. 
He chose the body that was created, but each individual decides whether or not they want to be in that body. They decided whether they wanted to go to the army or they decided that they wanted to be in the navy. And because of their decision, they were then placed into that unit. And then the president was able to select that unit based upon each individual's free will. You see, Yahweh's elect is just another name for the faithful members of the assembly, the body of Messiah, the family of Israel. Yahweh predestined the faithful to be saved, but each individual decides whether or not he will be among the faithful. It's your decision. Hence the saved are elect, but this is conditional, not unconditional. And they do actually have a choice. You see, the doctrine of once saved, always saved, as it appears in some churches today, is actually a product of Greek Western thinking on a subject that is 100% Hebraic. And it seeks to make a three-dimensional landscape into a one-dimension picture. And it strips away the truth of what a Hebraic understanding really is. And it places upon it a Greek understanding, which is not what Yeshua was talking about. Let us backtrack a little bit. You see, the starting point for any biblical discussion should not be the New Testament. It should always be the Old Testament, the Torah, the first five books of Moses, from Genesis through to Deuteronomy. Everything pertaining to the body of Messiah is in picture form in the Torah of Moses. Yahweh delivered or saved Israel out of Egyptian slavery and promised them what? A new life in the land of Canaan. But what happened? Most of them that left Egypt never made it into the promised land. Why? Because of unbelief. Numbers chapter 14, 1 to 38 and Hebrews chapter 3, 7 to 45 tells us that their unbelief was their cause of them not inheriting the promised land. They fell away from Yahweh's faith. Yahweh concretely revealed that a New Testament, New Testament believer, brothers and sisters, can in, in, in essence, in, in truth, can lose the promise of eternal life even though he was born again. We need to understand that what happened to Israel then, once saved, always saved, didn't work for them, and it's not going to work for us today. But today there are those that say that because salvation is all of Yahweh, you are saved whether you want to be or not. Even though salvation actually involves both you and Yahweh, even if you decide you don't want it, he will carry you through anyway because it's his will for you to be saved. They say that the scriptures say that neither Yahweh nor man nor angel can destroy the relationship which begins at salvation. And they also say that there is no sin that you can commit. It's something you have both now and eternally. It's a lie, brothers and sisters. You see, it's not a question of sinning that determines who makes it or not. If it were, think about it. Then Peter, who denied Yeshua three times, would never have been qualified. The key, uh, in essence, is repentance. As well as, as I said before, that word that Calvin says doesn't matter. Perseverance. But these concepts are only available to a heart that continually seeks Yeshua and His way of living. You see, Scripture teaches that eternal life is not guaranteed upon profession of faith. What many do not understand is that salvation and eternal life are not the same thing. Salvation is, in essence, the entrance into the family. But eternal life is the end goal and only happens when we are actually glorified and able to eat of the tree of life that is in the final garden. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 14. Are any one of us on this planet right now eternally alive right now? No. If that was the case, we would all be as Adam was in the garden after he sinned. We would be eternally alive in a fallen state. You see, our body needs to be changed, renewed, and the old body needs to be put off with the sin and passions. And we are to put on a new body, glorified, so that we might partake of the tree of life and live with our King forever. Again, salvation is the entry point on a lifelong journey, which is actually called sanctification. That helps us to change, as Paul says, from faith to faith and eventually from glory to glory. I want you to think of the following illustration. If I'm involved in a car accident and rescued by an ambulance, I am for the moment then what? Saved. But I'm saved only from my current situation. But that does not mean that I am secure, that I am 100% safe. Why? Because that ambulance can still have an accident on the way to the hospital. It's the duty of the driver to make sure that we are safe. 
That driver is you, I believe, and the Ruach. Because together we are to work out our salvation, as, as the scriptures say, with fear and trembling, so that on the day of Yeshua's return we will hear the words, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Well done, my good and faithful servant, that has done what? Much in my kingdom. You have done the same works that I did. So Calvin's theory of, of we don't need to do the works that happen after salvation is again a lie. We don't do the works to be saved. We do the works as an outworking of our salvation. An example of this is seen in Paul's writing. Let's have a look at what Paul says again. He says this, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Don't try to work out someone else's salvation. Don't work out anybody else's. Work out your own salvation. You see, Paul admonishes us to work out our salvation. If it were a one-time set thing, when we first professed, if there was this guarantee that once saved, always saved presents, there would have been no need for the apostle to speak like that. He would have understood it. But he doesn't understand it because it's not found in the scriptures. It's a man-made doctrine. You see, the biblical believer is to be totally sold out to Yeshua. All his life, just as the apostles were. It is a struggle or a fight. Paul speaks about the struggle, this fight. Yeshua talks about the struggle, the fight that we are to endure until the end. We fight it both against what our carnal nature, which would rather rule and reign in our lives and rebel against Yahweh. And then we also fight against external things like people who come against us. People who are not walking out their faith in Yeshua. We have trials, brothers and sisters, and we have tribulations. But these things are placed there in our lives to make us stronger, to help us understand and to overcome. Because in the end, it's the ones that overcome that receive the crowns of life. Paul exhorts Timothy and, and then just before his execution by Rome, he actually speaks of having fought the good fight of faith right up until the end. And he says this in both 1 Timothy and in 2 Timothy the following. He says, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. And then he says in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 7, he says, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. You know, brothers and sisters, Yeshua continually, when he, when he talks, he talks about this concept of perseverance. He talks about it in his parables. And one of the parables that he talks about it in is the parable of the sower of the seed. Only one of the four actually attained the promise of eternal life, symbolized in the bearing of fruit, in Matthew chapter 13, verse 3 to 23. Yet three of the four were supposed true believers. All three had a born-again experience, but Yeshua said that one of the three believers had stony ground, so that when tribulation arose, he left the faith. Another believer allowed the cares of this world to choke the seed of life within them. But it was only the third believer received the seed on good ground and he bore good fruit. Matthew chapter 7, 18 to 20, which speaks of the earthly walk. You see, two of the three in the parable that were born from above. And, and what's important is when we look at this parable, we see the word joy in Matthew chapter 13, 20. And that joy is a, is a joy that is not describable. It is a joy that comes from the Father. It reveals that this, this reborn experience actually happened. To claim, as some erroneously do, that they really weren't true or real believers is to begin with misinterprets. It's to begin with a misunderstanding and then take that misunderstanding all the way through the parable. And it actually destroys what Yeshua was teaching about the struggles of life in his kingdom. That there will be tribulation, that there will be trials, that we will have to cultivate our own soil. It was the soil that was cultivated that caused it to be rooted and take root. I believe that while they walked with Yeshua, they were true believers. You know, Scripture continues and it also speaks of the followers of Yeshua needing to watch, meaning to continually be aware of how we walk, lest we forget and then we are lost. In Matthew chapter 24 and verse 42, it says the following, Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your master is coming. You know, watching means that we must be about our 
Messiah's business. Just as he went about doing his father's business, the truth is that the one who loves Yeshua with all his heart, I believe, will want to know what the Messiah wants from him. While another who only gives lip service to belief won't devote the entire life to Yeshua. Are we willing to die daily? Are we willing to count the cost? Are we really willing to pick up our stake and follow him? That's what it's talking about. You know, there are also admonitions to persevere or endure to the end, which can only mean that our faith must be living and not just some mental ascent to Yeshua being the Savior. Savior. It mustn't just be, okay, so I confess my sins and I say a prayer and then all of a sudden my mind goes and I understand this, these things. No, there must be some outworking of our faith in our lives. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 12, it says, If we endure, we shall also reign with Him. If we deny Him, he will also deny us. Again, it's important. And Paul's speaking and he's saying, he's saying, you know, you need to endure to the end. And again, this passage, this admonition can only pertain to believers. But some might say, I won't deny him. So many people say, oh, but I won't do that. I'll never do that. But brothers and sisters, living a life of self is a form of denial of Yeshua. Look at what Paul wrote. He said this, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as carnal as to babes in Messiah. Again, Paul was writing to believers, but their lives were filled with ungodly attitudes and ways that could destroy their faith. You see, our lives must be in the process of being transformed into His image and likeness, and this takes nothing less than a heart that is a full devotion, a heart that is dedicated, a heart that doesn't have idols, a heart that is not divided, a heart whose, whose foot is not one foot in the world and one foot with Yahweh. It takes a heart that is full of devotion and dedication to Yeshua, and that dedication and that devotion needs to come from a place of love. Love for him. But you know, surely a man like Paul, who received his revelations directly from Yeshua, would have known for sure whether or not his salvation was assured. See, if the eternal salvation doctrine is true, then Paul of all people would have taught it and believed it, right? But on the contrary, Paul's own statements about the doubts that he had in his own life prove that this doctrine is not true. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 27 says this, But I keep my body, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be cast away. Now let's take a look at that word cast away. Cast away is actually the Greek word eidokaimos. It's one disapproved by the judge as not having fairly deserved the prize. So Paul goes on to state that we are to test to see if we are in the belief. Why would he say this if he believed in a once saved, always saved theology? Or for that matter, one of predestination? If there are those that are predestined for salvation, no matter what they do, then what is the point of preaching? Think about it. What is the point of preaching if everybody has already been predestined and chosen to life? Then we don't need to preach at all. But Paul says in Corinthians 13, verse 5, Examine yourselves whether you are in the belief. Prove yourselves or do you not know yourselves that, that Yeshua the Messiah is in you, unless you are what? Disapproved. Then he goes on in Matthew chapter 10, and verse 22, and, and Yeshua says, And you shall be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who shall have endured to the end shall be saved. Perseverance is one of the biggest words coming out continually from the teachings of Messiah Yeshua. Brothers and sisters, I believe that the biggest problem with people today is that they have a problem in understanding when eternal life is granted. You see, we may have hope of salvation, but it is not assured until the end, either the end of our lives or the end of the age when Yeshua comes to gather His people. You see, we have to ask ourselves, what does it mean to be saved? In a real world context, what does it mean to be saved? In order to understand the Hebrew perspective of these words that were spoken, we need to 
first distance ourselves from the Christian theology of salvation that so many of us have held on to even after we have left the church. This Christian understanding is one, as I said, of Greek Hellenism, which means to obtain an afterlife in a place called heaven. Christianity has assumed such a position under the influence of the same Hellenistic thought as the Pharisee, but they have divorced itself from the Old Testament and it has produced an opposite effect. So understanding how these Hebrew authors perceived being saved is actually essential in keeping us from falling into the same error. You see, brothers and sisters, without this understanding, without understanding what that word saved actually means to the Hebrew, the question then, are you saved? It actually doesn't make sense. If somebody asks you, are you saved, and you don't understand the reason or, or the meaning of what salvation means from a Hebrew perspective, then it will make absolutely no sense. Because what are you saved from? Saved from what? You see, to be saved or to save in Hebrew comes from Deuteronomy chapter 20 and verse 4, and it is yasa, which mirrors the Greek word sozo in its meaning, and it means actually to rescue, to save one suffering from disease, to make well, to heal, to restore to health. There is nothing, hear me out, there is nothing in this definition concerning a place called heaven. It is translated in John chapter 12 and verse 47 as save and in Romans 10 verse 9 as saved. We could all answer the question if it was, did someone rescue you from death? That is a yes or no question, not so. So if you were drowning and someone pulled you out of the water, you would know right away that you had been saved right now in the year and the now. You see, Yeshua himself said that the kingdom of heaven is among us right now. But yet Christianity is still looking for heaven. In the teaching the Samaritan woman that I did a while ago, we came to see that Yeshua was saying to the Samaritan woman at the well that those seeking the source of salvation, in other words, those seeking salvation, those looking for Him, will find that it comes from what? From a relationship. And that relationship is built on what? Intimacy and a connection with this particular Hebrew Elohim of Israel. Yahweh. It comes from understanding who Yahweh is, that Yahweh is the creator of mankind, that he himself is the source of life, the one that gives us this life. Brothers and sisters, the Hebrew word for life comes from the root word chaya, which means to live, have life, sustain life, to live prosperously, prosperously, be quickened, be alive, be restored to life or health. It's from where the Greek sozo explored earlier takes its meaning. But as far back as Numbers 31 and verse 15, that same Hebrew word chaya is also translated as saved. To be saved is to have life. And Yeshua said to have life is to keep the words of the Father, the Torah of Yahweh, the instructions of Yahweh. Are you beginning to understand this importance? As seen earlier, the Greek word for salvation in John 4.22 is soteria. Its meaning is deliverance from molestation. Deliverance also is used in the Hebrew primary as teshuva, which means salvation and deliverance. It is used also in 1 Chronicles 11.14 as deliverance and in 2 Chronicles 6.41 and Psalm 37.39 as salvation. Thus we see that the definitions for both salvation and deliverance are interchangeable. In either language. To be delivered is salvation. To be saved is real deliverance that truly sets us free from the physical runes of bondage. Brothers and sisters, when you are really saved, that's when you can expect the dunamis power of life to be evident within our physical bodies. And that's when the demons and darkness is supposed to flee. Because we are supposed to be found in the presence of Yahweh, in His Spirit. There is life. This is the life that Yeshua spoke of. It is the true words of life. So why is it that real healing and deliverance are are not only missing, and they're not even evident sometimes, among believers today, when a person is supposedly saved? 
Could it be that by separating themselves from the words found in the original writings in Yahweh's Torah, in his commandments, that these people have become separated from the instructions contained in those words, those instructions which actually help us to learn how to live and remain in the presence of the source of life, which is Yahweh himself. And when we live in the presence of Yahweh, who is the source of life, we mature, we grow, we become the people that he wants us to be. Brothers and sisters, we need to understand something, that many will fall away from the faith in these last days. Apostasy is when a true believer, one who has tested and tasted the Holy Spirit, the Ruach, and who is mature in the things of Yahweh, turns against him. As incredible as this may seem, this is biblical apostasy. And Yahweh says that he will cast all apostates into the lake of fire, into hell. One cannot be an apostate unless one has walked with the one true Elohim. You cannot be an apostate if you have not been in the original faith and known him intimately. Let me show you a few scriptures that speak of apostasy. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 4 says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the set-apart spirit and have tasted the good word of Elohim and the powers of the age to come and fall away to renew them again to repentance, having impaled for themselves the son of Elohim again and put him to open shame. For ground that is drinking the rain often falls on it, and is bearing plants fit for those whom it is tilled, receives blessing from Elohim. But if it brings forth thorns and thistles, it is rejected and near to being cursed and ends up being burned. Ezekiel 18.21 says, But the wrong, if he turns from all his sins which he has done, and he shall guard my laws, my Torah, my commandments, my words of life, and shall do right ruling and righteousness, he shall certainly live, he shall not die. Romans 11 verse 21. For if Elohim did not spare the natural branches, he might not spare you either. See then the kindness and sharpness of Elohim on those who fell sharpness, but towards you kindness, if you continue in his kindness. Otherwise you also shall be cut off. What does it mean to be cut off? Dismembered, taken away, removed. You see, brothers and sisters, most of those, as we said, who hold to the eternal security teaching, dread what they call works salvation. They believe that Yahweh requires nothing of his people but faith alone. Certainly we are not saved, as I said, by our works. Scripture is clear, very clear on that. We are not justified by keeping the law at all. But the truth is that once we are justified by his grace, however we are set apart for a holy purpose, And as I told you in the beginning, that purpose is called sanctification, which ultimately leads to glorification. And it's through sanctification that Yahweh expects His children to live holy and separate lives. He desires for you to be holy as He is holy, thereby becoming the kingdom of priests that we failed to be from the very beginning. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1. Having then these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of the flesh and spirit, perfecting set-apartness in the fear of Elohim. I want you to notice that this verse does not say that Yahweh cleanses us or cleans us, but rather it says, let us cleanse ourselves. We need to live purely. We all have a race to run, brothers and sisters, And Yahweh is faithful and just. The truth is we all sin. We are all complacent at times too. But how the heart responds to the spirit and the quickening of the spirit will determine who goes on and who falls by the wayside. Again, this teaching of one saved, always saved is not biblical. Matthew chapter 7 verse 13 and 14 says this, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. Galatians chapter 5, 22-25 But the fruits of the Spirit, 
love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are messiahs have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. We have to grow up. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 to 3. It says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called sons of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not, pardon me, did not know Him. Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who has this hope in Him purifies himself, just as He is pure. It is our duty to persevere. It is our duty to live a holy, set-apart life. 1 John 2, 5-6 to 6. But whoever guards His word, His commandments, His laws, His Torah, truly the love of Elohim has been perfected, matured in Him. By this we know that we are in Him. The one who says he stays in Him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. The reason why so many believers are falling away from the faith is because they are not remaining in Yeshua. They are not walking as he desires. They do not understand the difference between the holy and the profane. How can they when they disregard his laws? Let's have a look at John 15, 1 to 11. I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away. But every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. It's not talking about unbelievers. It's talking about a believer. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. As the Father loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. There he says it. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. These things I have spoken to you, that your joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. Brothers and sisters, you know, today, many believers seem to think that they are secure in the hands of Abba, and that they can go on living like they want, lawless, And they quote the following scripture to prove their point. In John chapter 10 and verse 27 onwards, it says this, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them everlasting life, and they shall by no means ever perish. And no one shall snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hands. But again, context is key. If we read a scripture out of context, we can make it apply and twist it for anything that we want. The truth of the context of that passage is that the setting in Yeshua's statement is the earth and it's when He returns at His second coming. Because when He returns, He will judge the earth and reward the faithful, both the living and the dead, with salvation and eternal life. And those who have been found ready will be taken and nobody will ever be able to return to take away from them what they have received. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 12 says this, And see, I am coming speedily, and my reward is with me, to give to each of you according to his work. I am the Aleph and the Tav, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those doing his commands, so that the authority shall be theirs unto the tree of life, and to enter through the gates into the city. Blessed are those doing His commands, so that the authority shall be theirs unto the tree of life, right at the end. You see, the secret is that those who do His commands are granted life. 
We need to understand that salvation is truly then granted at the end. And this is when you will enter in the gates. The work Yeshua is speaking of is the works of Torah. The works that He did, the same works that Yeshua did for His Father, is supposed to do the same, be the same works that we are supposed to do. This is why, brothers and sisters, I want to say this to you in closing. We need to understand covenant in the final days. We need to understand how our Elohim wants us to mature and why He wants us to mature. He wants a bride that is reflecting Him. He wants a bride that keeps the commandments, that is separate from the world, that is different, that is not defiled. A bride whose garments are shining white. A bride who has made herself ready. A bride who reflects her King. Brothers and sisters, don't fall into the trap of believing that everything is okay. That we can just ride it out and then we can live like we want, do what we want, think what we want, watch what we want, and everything's going to be okay. The reason why so many believers today do not hear the voice of Yahweh is because they live a compromised life. The reason why so many people are struggling is because they haven't truly found Yeshua in the beauty of holiness. They haven't truly come face to face in a relationship of intimacy where there is not only repentance but true Teshuvah, where they have changed, renewed and totally set free. Where the seeds have taken root in the ground that has been prepared. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you in the wonderful and, na- wonderful and powerful name of Yeshua Mashiach. Father, that you are the one true Elohim. Father, we want to pray today in the name of Yeshua. Father, that people will come to understand how important it is, Father, that we are no longer children tossed around by every wave of doctrine, but that we mature. Father, that we are rooted in Messiah Yeshua, that we do not abide in anything else but in Him, that we may bear much fruit, because in that you are well pleased. Father, I pray that the fruit that we that we have will remain, that it will be used, Father, in these final days as a testimony to the nations, Father, that you are our King. I pray, Father, that we will be secure, that we will be warriors in the kingdom of Messiah Yeshua, guarding the commandments, Father, living a holy, set-apart life unto you, so that we might be different, so that we might become the kingdom of priests that you've desired us to be in this final generation. Father, we thank you, we honor you, we give you all the praise and all the glory. And we thank you, Father, that you are the way, the truth, and the life. Yeshua came so that we might have life, so that we might have life in abundance, so that we may be able, Father, to come and stand in the source of life and receive what you have given us. We thank you for his sacrifice, we thank you for his life, and we thank you, Father, for all that you have done for us. And we thank you for this in Yeshua's name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I want to say thank you for joining me. It's always a pleasure to share with you. I invite you to head over to treasuredinheritanceministry.com where you can join our website. It's free and you can get all our teachings there and download them. I also would like to invite you, please subscribe to this channel. Um, We always ask you to subscribe because subscribing and liking the videos and and sharing them helps us to get them out to more. So you can play your part by doing that and by helping us to really get these teachings out to more people. We thank you again for joining us and I look forward to meeting you on the next video. Until then, may Yahweh bless you, may Yahweh keep you, may Yahweh make His face to shine upon you. Shalom. Shalom.